good. All right. Just for the sake of the video, my name is Douglas B. Gibbs, and we're getting ready to start a Constitution class. Okay. Now. Oh, well, I'll do the pledge first thing, right? Then I'm sure I'll be able to share it. Uh, please join me in the pledge. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm actually going to move this right here so that it gets more of a front hole. Does that make sense? It's not way over there. It's closer, but. Yeah, no, I think it's good. All right. Why does it say that you're? Yeah, that's okay. Hang on a second. So we're going to record me for the first time in a long time. There was a, a gentleman named Joe who used to come to classes and record it, but the audio was awful. So I told uh, Ken about the awful audio. So he had the idea of this. So we'll see how it works out. Okay. This little device sounded good earlier. All right, let's see. Yeah, let's see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to your page. Ask, ask how well they can hear. My wife on. So well, I don't know if anybody's on there yet. There is. But there is. There is, there is yeah. really? And my wife is there in this other page. Yeah. All right, so how does the volume sound? I guess that's what we want to test right now. So those of you who are watching, put in there. I wonder why I've not seen video yet here. Is it playing? Is it really yeah. recording? It's under the Ken Williams page? No. YouTube. Oh, well, I thought you were doing a Facebook Live. No. So I was going to share. Yeah, no, we're doing I, I don't do, I don't know. You don't do Facebook Live? Oh, that's what I do. All right, well, then never mind. No wonder I couldn't find it. Okay. <laughs> Got two or three at home. I'm not okay, you're not going to take any more. We got two or three at home. Um, let's talk about, let's begin with historical influences on the U.S. Constitution. Just off the top of your head, what do you think were historical influences? We can put documents. You want them in order or what? Uh, you know, I have to be in order, but you know, what do you think? Events, people. Let's just say the Holy Bible in general, because uh, Old Testament mainly, but actually there are some New Testament passages too that were influential. So Holy Bible is a document that was influential on the United States Constitution. What else? The Magna Carta. Yes. What was that? The Magna Carta. Okay. Magna Carta? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we are going in order, it looks like. Okay, Magna Carta. What else? What are the document events or people? Glorious Revolution event. When did the Glorious Revolution happen? Sixteen eighty-eight was Glorious Revolution. What happened sixteen eighty-nine? Year after. English Bill of Rights. English Bill of Rights or the English Declaration of Rights, whichever one. Uh, yeah, either name works. So, English Bill of Rights. All right. What other documents, people, or events? Common law. Common law. Um, yeah, that's a general subject, but we say English common law. Let's put that down here. What else? What else had an influence on the U.S. Constitution? How about the American Revolution itself? Right? Event? American Revolution? <clears throat> you think the massacre of Boston? Boston, Boston Massacre, Boston Tea Party, all of those things that came up before the revolution. How about Shays Rebellion? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So how many people on here? Well, I'm trying to remember the names of uh, your Roman friends. Yeah, who are our Roman friends? Well, you've got two Romans and one Greek I'm looking for specifically. Cicero, do you want Cicero. Yeah, Cicero. Okay. Well, Socrates had some influence, but in a very minor way. But I tell you, one that had a lot of influence 
Aristotle. Who, who was Socrates' a student? Okay, who, who's the other Roman and another Greek? Plato. Plato was influential, but in a very minor way. Who, who am I looking for? How about Cato? You ever heard of the Cato Institute? There, it's actually named after a guy named Cato in the Roman, uh, during the Roman Republic, who was, as Cicero, in my opinion, was the greatest politician of the Roman Republic era. Cato was right on his heels in greatness, but much more conservative and a little considered even radical by some compared to Cicero. Uh, Cicero wound up getting murdered in the end for his patriotism, but at least he was an old man and had a long life before he got assassinated. But uh, who's the other Greek I'm looking for? Yeah, for those of you who've gone through this before. Hint, he was originally Greek, loved the Roman Republic system. When Rome took over Greece, they deported him to Rome. He gave them a lot of ideas to save the Roman Republic, but they rejected it, and they still went into an empire anyway. Who was that guy? And his writings were to the founders. He came, he came before Cicero. Polybius. Polybius, P-O-L-Y-B-I-U-S, Polybius. All right, so now let's, let's go back to those then in, in order of importance in your view of the people. Well, we haven't even talked about them yet. Well, we're only like halfway through the people. Well, so we're done with the Romans and the Greeks, okay, well, but well, who we got more? Who else do we got? Well, we're done with the old people. Yeah. yeah, okay, we're done with the older people. Hey, don't say that around these groups. Some okay. people might get nervous. All right. uh, <laughs> well, can you go through those four and tell me which how you? Are I'm going to get to them. But I want name, I want names, places, and things first, and then we'll talk about them. I want to see how much you guys can remember from the last time we went through this. All right. How about John Locke? How about oh, the, that that guy with the funny French name? Robespierre. Montesquieu. Montesquieu. I always script the end, so I'll, uh, I'll scribble the end of the thing. Um, you know, we've still got maybe an, a, an event or two. We've got a, a bunch more documents. Uh, English common law is not what something was on mine, but thank you for bringing it up. That's brilliant because it, it definitely had a when, heavy influence. When, uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabeth Powell had an influence. Um, yeah, but she had even more of an influence on the Constitution after it was written than before. But, but that's a good one, Elizabeth Powell. I'll, I'll go with that, but I'm not going to put her up there because she's more of a post-convention influence rather than a pre-convention influence. I'm talking about pre-convention influences. Who else? Who else? Yeah, what yeah, else? When else? else? All right. Who else? How about the Saxons? Oh, okay. Ah! <laughs> yeah, everybody's going, oh, I should have thought of that. The Saxons. We'll get, I'm going to go over all this because today, tonight is historical influence preamble. That's what we're going through tonight. Sure. All right. Well, you know, go back to events. We got the Glorious Revolution, the American Revolution, Shays Rebellion. I don't know the landing at Plymouth. Here. Okay. Now, if you got the landing at Plymouth, then what document goes along with that? Mayflower Compact. Mayflower Compact. Well. Charter, the, the charters are very important, and we'll, we'll explain those. How about the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut? You should know that one. Yeah, but Fundamental of Connecticut. That's an important influence. What else? How about the Articles of Confederation? You know, we, uh, How about the Burgess Committees, which I've never really talked about? You know what the Burgess commu Committees were? That was basically the first legislative kind of union, united legislative session. So you guys will look that up later. What else? Well, we don't have very many events up here, do we? Well, we what, what about Slovenia? What about Slovenia? The Slovenians, thank you. All right, so if the Slovenians had such a an influence, and yeah, you're looking at your notes now. This um, was August 15th last year that we had this, so 
it's been almost a year. Oh, geez. You better go through this quickly this time. Yeah. We've got people watching now. Um, all right, the Slovenians. Who else? A social compact? Social contract. So uh, that would be John Locke. And who's the other person I talked about social contracts? You know who it was? He actually had a negative influence uh, in many ways, but, but some positive. How about a guy named Jean Jacques Rousseau? You want to tell the story of. Oh, I'll get to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jean Jacques Rousseau is one of my favorite people back to life, um, right there with uh, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm still looking for more events. What about Clodius? Clodius? Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Uh, Clodius, actually, but yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't know if you're going to say C-L-O-D-I-U-S. Oh, I put it, I put C-I-U-S. Yeah, D. Clodius is very interesting. Oh, okay, let, let, let's... If it's a hero or an anti-hero. He's an anti-hero. Okay. He's sort of like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I'll put him up here. Uh, yeah. Even though I, I didn't expect him to be brought up, I'll put well, him you, up here. You threw him out. I mean, yeah, no, that, that's a good one. That's a good one. We'll talk about Clodius, because Clodius will remind you of a recent president of the United States, you know, number 44. Mm -hmm. They had kind of similar tendencies, you know, like using uh, uh, violence in the streets to get their way, you know, things like that. Yeah, that's going on during the Roman. Clodius was the first Roman Republic consul that started really pushing us towards empire or uh, Roman Empire towards Roman Republic towards empire. And he kind of used some really messed up techniques like violence in the streets, street gangs that would create violence in the streets. Because, the because what happens when there's violence in the streets? <laughs> what happens when there's violence in the streets and your, your neighbors get killed? You start screaming for what? Help from the government. Yeah, I need help. <laughs> so you're the government guy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. What about, now, again. Oh, so I have a couple more documents, a lot more events. Annapolis Convention. Annapolis Convention, absolutely. Thank you. That's a big yeah. one. Annapolis Convention. Annapolis Convention. That's huge. That was in 1786. Uh, August of 1786, and this is where not all the states had sent their delegates convention, but a number of them had. And this is where um, really Alexander Hamilton, one of the few things he was good about, but his motive was wrong, but his what he did was good. Sort of like some of some of these judges sometimes where they they rule properly but for the wrong reason. Well, uh, Alexander Hamilton had the right idea, but for the wrong motive at the Annapolis Convention, and that was we need to fix the, we need to fix the Articles of Confederation. We should hold a new convention to do that in May of 1787, and everybody caught on, thought it was a great idea. It was Madison and, and Hamilton that really had the idea, but Hamilton was really the, the, the idea maker and the pusher of it. All right. Um, so, so you could put, now, uh, under people, I'm not going to get all the founding fathers, but all the founding fathers obviously are on that list too, you know, the Hamiltons and Jeffersons and, and Madisons, even though Jefferson wasn't at the convention, Benjamin Franklin and so on and so forth. I'm looking for people outside. There's Edmund Burke, which, which I'm not going to put on the list because we're not going to talk about him much, but there's Edmund Burke. Yeah, there's another one. Huh? Yeah, pagans. Well, the reason why pagans is there is because the Saxons were pagans. <clears throat> but yet they had come to the same conclusion the Israelites had come to in the sense of, of government and limited government and limiting the authorities and so on and so forth. It's interesting how when you know the truth, you come to the same conclusions. But the thing is, that system of liberty that the Saxons really established really fit the Protestant mindset real well, not necessarily the, 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 the Catholic mindset of the time. Catholic Church was more of an authoritarian system, so it worked real well with these authoritarian monarchies. But now to the north, you've got the barbarians. Remember the Romans talked about all the barbarians that came down from the north? The barbarians were the Saxons, the Viscots, and there's all these different groups. So the Saxons were really one of the main groups. The Saxons, that's not an ethnic group. That's not a nationality. That's not a, uh, a, a, a particular skin tone. The Saxons were named Saxons because this particular group 
carried a blade on their side they called a sax, S-A-X. And so the Romans began to call them Saxons because they carried this sax. That's really where it comes from. So anyway, so these pagans out of Germany, the Saxons, had this idea that no one's above the law, including the king, including the leader. Everyone's entitled to their day of, their day of tri uh, trial, a fair trial, um, their day in court. Uh, you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, one, of the, one of the customs they had was if you were a prisoner, you got in trouble or something, your weapon would be taken from you. When you were set free, your weapon was given back to you. Your arm was your sign of freedom. To be unarmed was to be a subject. To be armed was to be a member of the populace, a citizen, free. Very, very interesting, isn't that? that? That may be a part of where the idea of the right to keep and bear arms comes from with the founding fathers because of that traditional Saxons. But there was another influence also. You can go to the Holy Bible and actually in the book of Luke, uh, Luke, uh, I want to say 523, is it? I brought it up to you just yeah, recently. Yeah. Where it, Jesus basically says, hey, man, you know, uh, it, it, uh, if you don't have a sword, sell what you have and go buy a sword. You need to be armed. Jesus says, keep and bear arms, in other words, <laughs> in the book of Luke. So uh, the idea of the right to keep and bear arms comes both from the Saxons and from the Bible. Uh, but anyway, the Saxons, uh, as they moved westward, they invaded the, the, the British Isles. Uh, Rome had trouble hanging on to it, and by then the, the, the barbarians took over. The barbarians, by the way, where do you think the word barbarian came from? Because now, let me back up. When we hear the word barbarian, our lexicon has been so twisted and maneuvered that there are certain ideologies out there that want you to think certain things about certain words in certain ways. Barbarians, believe it or not, is one of those things because the barbarians were really the ones that started this whole system of liberty and well, the enemies of the constitution don't want you liking that or wanting that. They want you to fall into the old Roman authoritarian system. So the word barbarians comes from the Romans, uh, when they heard the barbarians in the North talk, it, to them it sounded like bar, 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 so they called them barbarians. So they didn't understand the language. But in today's lexicon, a barbarian is someone who's out of control, chaos, can't be trusted, da 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 da, da. The barbarians in the North are actually the ones that have the limited government. They're the ones that were they actually, in, in my opinion, the more civilized. Wow. All right? Wow. So now there's a line between the Saxons and the old Roman Empire authoritarianism. In Europe. If you look back in history, those countries are kind of along that northern portion of uh, Europe. Yeah. You know, you got, you know, Germany and, and uh, Belgium and, and, and Netherlands, Holland, uh, you know, British Isles, Sweden, all that were influenced by the Saxon system. And then everything kind of below that line, that was the old Roman Empire, Catholicism, Catholicism yeah. authoritarian system. That line exists in North America. It actually moved over to North America. It's the um, it's the Mexican American border. Countries north of uh, that border, those are the ones that are based on the Saxon system, the English speaking peoples. If you want to if you want to get specific, everything south of that border that's based you know Spanish and Portuguese, right? So that's based on the old Roman Empire authoritarian system. So that idea of authoritarianism has continued even to this day. So the reason why one of our frustration with the legal aliens is they're coming up here with this mindset of government supposed to be in control of everything, give them everything. Because that's that's the old world Roman government, monarchy, Catholicism kind of system. Get north of that line. So, whoa, no, you need to buy into our Saxon system of limited government. The government doesn't have any authorities beyond what it's been given by the people in the states in our case. And so on and so forth. So anyway, so that's the Saxons. Let's cross them out. Luke twenty-two thirty-six. Luke twenty-two thirty-six. Thank you. Boy, I was way off. I said five twenty-three. Twenty-two thirty-six. I knew it was in Luke. At least, at least I said the book of the Bible right. <laughs> also, when it comes to our system, let's talk about the Holy Bible for a second, since you just mentioned it again. Uh, most of our system is based on not only the Saxons but also on the Mosaic system. 
which you find most of the information in Deuteronomy and Numbers. In the old Israeli system, they had a union of sovereign entities, 12 tribes. But instead of states, it was tribes. 12 tribes of Israel, they were unique, individual, autonomous, <clears throat> sovereign tribes that were unique and different from each other, but they came together in a union of Israel, just like the United States. Okay. They, had, they had the executive, they had the two legislative branches, and in their judicial system, once again, innocent until proven guilty. And, and their judicial system is much like the way ours is set up. You know, impartial jury, the whole bit. So, uh, so it's interesting because we borrowed a lot from the Mosaic system, the Saxon system, but a lot of it is similar. But yet they knew nothing of each other. Remember, the Saxons were pagans. So they didn't go, hey, we ought to follow that Mosaic system. They were pagans. They didn't know what the Mosaic system was, nor did they care. But yet they came to the same conclusions as the Israelites, which were God-led. Their system was given to them by God. And then you got this other system that has nothing to do with God, but yet it's all about limited government, and it's very similar. They're very similar to each other. It, the, the similarities are striking. So when Protestantism started hitting Britain, mainly because of a, uh, uh, a, a king who wanted to get a divorce, and we won't get into the whole story. <laughs> the Church of England, how that started. It was a good fit because in Catholicism, it wouldn't have worked because the idea was more authoritarian. But when it came to Protestantism, Martin Luther's attitude was we're individuals and we should be able to read the scripture individually and make our decisions. And, and look what we've learned from the tribes of Israel. And that fit very well in the Saxon system because the, solemn, the, solemn, the similarities were striking. Interesting historical influences. Okay. Question. The Iroquois. Indians. Iroquois. Um, I don't know if it had a lot of influence. The Iroquois, Iroquois Confederation Constitution, or at least that's what it's called now. I don't think that's what they called it. Uh, the Iroquois Confederation, they had a constitution that was very similar to what we put. A lot of people will tell you that the founding fathers stole Iroquois Confederation. Thing is, a lot of the language that constitution also comes from Magna Carta and, and the English Bill of Rights. So which is it? Can't be both. Or can it? Once again, if you come to the same conclusions, you're going to have a lot of similarities. So I don't think that the founders, I, I, I think that they were aware of the Iroquois Confederation and their rule of law and the way they set it up, but I don't think that that was a primary influence. I think it was, oh, look, they're confirming what we already believe. They, they're doing almost the same thing. What a coincidence. I think it was more like that. That's just me. We don't have any hard evidence that shows that the Iroquois Confederation had a heavy influence on the founders or didn't. There's no evidence either way. I think they were aware of it, but I don't believe that it was the primary influence. That's just me. All right. Uh, so let's see. We talked about the Bible. Talked about, well, we talked a little bit about Cato and Cicero. Let's talk about these guys a little bit more. Let's talk about Aristotle, actually. Plato, Plato was mentioned earlier. Plato believed that there should be a ruling elite. And that a civilization should be ruled over by that ruling elite. There should be philosophers. Well, you thought a system run by a bunch of politicians and lawyers would be bad. Could you imagine something run by a bunch of philosophers? Uh, Aristotle didn't agree. Uh, some people call him the father of conservatism. Aristotle believed in wanted to go completely back to the Roman Republic, so there was those differences. But Cicero was probably the greatest of all the Roman politicians ever. Uh, and he was alive at a time when uh, the Republic was turning into an empire. And he had to, at one point was a consul. When it came to the Roman system, the consul was the executive, the executive branch. And they had two of them. This is, uh, we're talking about Cicero. They did have two consuls, so that way they could balance each other out. They didn't want one person have too much power. Uh, when, when Rome was a kingdom, they actually had like 10 kings. I think it was even a larger number than that at one point. Because once again, they didn't want any one person to have too much power. That was the Roman thinking. But eventually, you did wind up with these Caesars where one person did have all the power. Amazing how human nature eventually sends a system, no matter how much it tries to protect itself, into tyranny. Uh, Cicero was a lawyer and an orator, uh, which kind of the same thing, but an orator basically is a speaker 
but lawyers tended to be orators, kind of went one and the same together. But anyway, Cicero um, at one point had, had to, because of what was going on and he was standing up against it, especially when it came to Clodius and his uh, uh, emergence, uh, at one point Cicero actually uh, was exiled. It was a kind of a cross between them exiling him and him being glad to do it, a self-exile. Uh, but he came back when he realized things had gone too far and it was time to try to turn it around, but by then it was just too late. Uh, Cicero, um, one of the primary readers of Cicero was Thomas Jefferson. The interesting thing about Thomas Jefferson is Thomas Jefferson didn't just read Cicero's works, he read them in the original Latin. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson was brilliant, spoke many languages, could, you know, he spoke French, spoke English, spoke a couple of other languages, and he spoke Latin, and he could read Latin. Were, you guys, were these guys homeschooled? <laughs> were these guys homeschooled? Yeah, <laughs> essentially many of them were, uh, because it really wasn't a system like there is today. Uh, but anyway, uh, Cicero was probably the greatest influence on Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson was a huge influence on the convention, even though he wasn't there. I can remember 2016 during the election cycle, and a candidate named Ben Carson had made a comment of how influential Jefferson was on the Constitutional Convention. And the leftist media just went after him and accused him of not knowing he's talking about because Jefferson wasn't even in the country, he was in France. That is true, Jefferson was in France, but he was corresponding with a number of, of delegates at the convention daily, one of them being James Madison, and Jefferson had a heavy influence on that convention. So even though he wasn't there, he was very influential. Ben Carson was correct. All right, let's uh, take Cicero off the list. John Locke, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Let's talk about both of these guys. John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau were the two people who mostly wrote about social contracts. They considered a constitution a social contract as opposed to common law. Common law, English common law, was essentially not written. And so it was a living and breathing thing that changed with the whims of society as society changed. Politicians, judges, and society itself, culture itself, could change common law just by the changes of society. That, that's what English common law was, and that's what the left believes about the Constitution. But John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau talked about a social contract, how a constitution is a social contract, that societies, the members of society have an agreement together to live together and follow by certain rules. That's the social contract. And that sometimes those social contracts need to be written down so that they're not living and breathing, but they are set in stone, essentially. Black letter of the law. It is not the Constitution is a social contract that's written down. It is not supposed to be living in some judge says so, or because society has decided this is okay. Yes, sir. You mentioned black letter. Why black letter? Well, because that's the uh, color of the ink, black letter of the law. Okay. Yeah, you think if someone on the left might think I'm a racist because I said that? <laughs> I, I, you pointed that out. So I'm going oh, you were curious. Okay. Black letter of the law because, yes, the color of ink was black. Um, actually, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Blackstone uh, comes to mind, too. For everyone. Whenever I think black letter of the law, I think of Blackstone, black law. Uh, there's a book about that Blackstone wrote about the law that's very, very good. And it's always think black letter and black or stone kind of fits. But anyway. And then you've got other people also like Bastiat who wrote the law yeah. and a little book, very good book to read about the law and the rule of law. Anyway, get back to John Locke and John Jacques Rousseau. So they believe that a, con that a constitution is a social contract, which means it is not living and breathing, which means it doesn't flow or change with whims of society or if a judge says so. It says what it says. Only it can be changed is by amendment. Now here's where the two men differ. Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed in something called the general will, and John Locke believed in something called natural law. Natural law, John Locke, general will, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The general will is a will of the people that the people don't recognize because we're just too stupid. But there is a ruling class, an elite ruling class that knows what this general will of the people is. They recognize it, so it's their job to implement it, whether the people like it or not. And to restrain 
these people by the body politic when necessary to ensure they follow the general will. Because, this is what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, and this is one of my favorite quotes in history, is it's, it's, it pretty much sums up a particular group of politicians today. Because a man must be forced to be free. So, kind of, so, sort of sounds like, um, uh, oh, what do they call it? Net neutrality, right? Because the internet needs to be forced to be free by government. Mm -hmm. Same kind of concept, right? John Locke said, no, no, we have what's called natural law. Our rule of law comes from natural law, and our natural law comes from God. It's natural. And in the Declaration of Independence, in fact, they explain that. They say that. Let's read that real quick. I want to get you guys up with this. John Locke is all over the Declaration of Independence. The man was like in the last couple of years of his life at the time that the Declaration was written. I'm sure if he got a chance to see it, he was very proud of the American colonists. Well, let's take a look real quick. Let's talk about natural law, natural rights, and John Locke's attitudes on this. His language is throughout this Declaration of Independence in the very beginning. I'm going to start from the beginning. So on page 35, your pocket constitution. If you guys on video don't have a pocket constitution, you should. Page 35 of this pocket constitution, which comes from the National Center of Constitutional Studies, nccs.net. All right. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, okay, so we got the colonists are connected to Britain. They need to break these bands that connect them. And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station, equality, and separate is individualism. So it's individualism and equality, but what kind of equality? What kind of individualism? To which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Your individuality, your equality, is based on God's definitions. The laws of nature and of nature's God. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. You flip the page, don't do it now, do it at home sometime. You can go through the list of grievances. They sound an awful lot like the ones we have today with federal government. In short, our federal government has become the very King George government that we fought a revolution against. Just saying. Now, here's the next part. Now, now when it comes to your natural rights, you already established one part, that you, you are entitled by God as an individual and equally. Okay, so that's the first characteristic here, natural law and natural rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident. There's your second characteristic. Self-evident. We know it. It's obvious. When a woman gives birth to her child, it's obvious to her that she should raise and care for that child. Of course, if you're not a virtuous person, you don't have any value system, you may not recognize that self-evident thing. That's why we have a whole generation of women now that are killing their babies in the womb. Because they deny what's self-evident to them. I guarantee you it's self-evident. They just deny it. That all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator. Endowed by their creator. There's God mentioned another time of entitling you to your rights. With certain unalienable rights. Unalienable is the last characteristic. They are inseparable from you because they are your possession. They belong to you. There is, there is a part of you as your hip. So yes, you're joined at the hip with your rights. <laughs> they are yours. And I'm going to bring up a word in a minute that's going to help explain a little bit about that. That to secure these rights, I'm sorry, back up, unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. If you read John Locke's writings, he says life, liberty, and property. They decided property was not best because then then it may be considered by government that it was for them to guarantee you a piece of property or the people could scream that they have a right to property. You don't have a right to property. You don't have a right to happiness. What do you have a right to? Pursuit, pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of your property. Pursuit of the cake you want baked. Pursuit of your health care. All right. You have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You don't have a right to that cake to be 
baked it for you. You don't have a right to a lot of these things you think you have a right to, but you do have a right to pursue them. Well, it's nice that they didn't say the right to pursue life or liberty. Well, life and liberty, it's not a matter of pursuing, right? You, you are back to that's, that's your right, man. I have a right to be alive. And you and I have a right for you not to kill me. Which gets back to well, uh, the, the point about the babies being killed in the womb. At what point does personhood begin unless, where that right begins? Unless I am my elitism and my knowledge of general will that you're not cognizant of means that you should die in my Yeah, well, then, see, that, that's why Jean-Jacques Rousseau is not in the Declaration and John Locke is. Kind of a Dr. Favorian type. Yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine if they had followed Jean-Jacques Rousseau's teachings instead? Then it wouldn't have been an American Revolution. It would have been the French Revolution. Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed in the general will, secular system, a secular system, and a collectivistic system. The difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution, by the way, um, the French and Indian War would be another event that influenced, by the way. Um, the difference with the French Revolution and the American Revolution is individuality versus collectivism and a godly value system versus secularism. Those two things are the only things that separate those two revolutions. The French modeled their revolution after ours, except for those two things, and those two things are what made it go awry. Without God, without individualism, you get the French Revolution. An awful lot of beheadings, which I was reading today. Actually, there were more beheadings by uh, Hitler's. Nazis than there was during the French Revolution, as many as there were in the French Revolution. The French Revolution was like 1650 or something like that. And well, I mean, when, I'm, when I'm in meetings and stuff, I'm also reading stuff and paying attention out of one ear and reading with the other eye and all that. But anyway, I'm always trying to learn. And it got brought up in a meeting actually this morning about beheading, so I had to look it up and learn about it because I was curious. Mm -hmm. But anyway, all right, so. Now, here's the part that's really important, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That to secure these rights, doesn't say protect. And in fact, in this handout, I put the word protect at one point, and I had to go back and change it to secure. So this copy I think I gave you says protect, but it really should say secure. Government's not there to protect your rights. Why? The biggest danger, the greatest danger to your rights is government. Yeah. Government's the greatest danger to your rights than anything. So if government's the greatest danger to your rights, do you want them protecting you from them? No. Here comes government. We're going to hold up a shield against government. Well, that's, that's idiotic. They're going to guard us against them. That's like, you know, Fox saying, no, no, I'll take care of the hen house. Don't worry. I got it. I'll protect it against the foxes. Right? Government's not there to protect your rights. Government's not there to guarantee your rights. Remember, you can pursue your rights. You're not guaranteed anything, except for life and liberty. That's yours. Everything else you got to pursue when it comes to your rights. I don't. I have a right to keep and bear arms, but I don't have it if I don't go. If I don't pursue the ability to go buy it, I don't make enough money to go buy it. I, you know, I can't. I, the gun just doesn't suddenly appear in my hand. I got to pursue it too, don't I? I got to, I got to, you know, build it or, or you know, you know, go out there with the, you know, be a blacksmith and put it together, or you know, save up the money to purchase it or whatever. I have, I have a right to keep and bear arms, but actually, there's, there should, really should be a pursuit in there because it's not going to be like I have a right to keep and bear arms, and it's not going to suddenly be mine. I got to go get it, right? So technically, the pursuit thing even applies there. But uh, life, that's already yours, right? It's there. You don't have to pursue it. You're already alive, and you have a right to that life. Your liberty is already there, and you have a right to that liberty, and you have a right for the government not to interfere with that liberty. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, those are your rights, and they are not to be protected by government. They are not to be guaranteed by government. They are to be, according to the Declaration, secured by government. It's fascinating. Let's run over the preamble real quick. I'm going to show you something. In the preamble, it says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. What's that next part? And what's that next word? Secure. 
the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution of the United States. Secure the blessings of blessings of liberty is your rights and your freedom. Secure. So government's there to secure. It says so in the declaration, it says so in the preamble. Why is the word secure so important? What does secure mean? Keep it safe, keep it in place where it belongs because your rights belong to you. So it's their job not to interfere with it. It's your possession. And then when they restrain themselves, then if there's other forces there that also want to interfere with your rights, then they can also act to help secure it from those other things also. But first they must restrain themselves. In fact, James Madison actually writes that in one of his special papers. Um, that, that first, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact wording. I'll have to get to it another time. But uh, that, that government has created a, a first to, to restrain the people and then to restrain themselves. What it means by is, you know, keep the people from like killing each other and all that jazz, you know, law enforcement, and then restrain themselves. Why? Because they're a danger to your rights too. So they must restrain themselves to make sure that your rights remain secure. They are there to secure your rights, not to protect them, not to guarantee them. So they say, hey, we're there to. To, to protect and guarantee your health care, well, and then all the rates go up, right? What's the clause about the uh, chaining down the government by the Constitution? Is that in here? That's not in here, but that's uh, something that uh, Jefferson said. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it was Jefferson, pretty sure, by, by, by the chains of the. Well, the word secure, though, that, that goes back. That's a great way of putting it. The way I like to explain this federal government. Because uh, also the word secure can go the other way. Well, I like to explain this federal government that created is what was happening was Shays Rebellion had shown. Remember Shays Rebellion? We we're talking about Shays Rebellion. The uh, the revolutionary veterans were paid basically worthless money because under the Articles of Confederation there was no value behind the money. All they did was just print it and. And sent it out there, just kept printing fake, you know, fiat money that was worthless. Well, You'd think we'd learn by now. Uh-huh. Right? And so the, the so these veterans, they get this money, go to pay their bills, and their creditors say, We aren't gonna take that. It's worthless. You know, we'll take colonial script or co- continentalist. You know, we'll take gold, we'll take silver. We're not taking that garbage. So now you're a veteran. The, the country's a country because of you. You fought the war, and yet you can't even pay your bills, and the creditors are starting to sue you. So what are you going to do? You're going to be mad. You're going to start protesting. And then to stop the creditors from going to the courts, you're going to start blocking the courts of the courthouses, or the steps of the courthouses. It was just what they did. And then they start blocking the armory, and then they tried to break into the armory so they could be armed and nobody else could. So, And, and everybody said, hey, this is a problem. If your states, go get your militias. Then we'll, it's our militias that are uh, protesting. We can't go get the militias to take care of this. Well, then how are we going to fix this problem? Well, this Articles of Federation, what does it say? It says we can't tax, we can't form an army, so sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, guess guess who the creditors work for and work with? The corporations, or back then, the merchants. Merchants are saying, hey, I'm not getting my money. And the creditors are like, well, I'm not getting my money. I can't give you money if I don't get mine. So the corporations, I'm sorry, the merchants, I keep giving corporations because today, you know, corporations kind of comes to mind. I don't think all corporations are evil, but I think uh, there's a good number of them, yeah. to put it that way. But just imagine, though, uh, as I say this, if this was today. So the merchants in Boston put together a mercenary force to show up and take, take those veterans down. Imagine if today, upset at the veterans, they fought in Afghanistan, fought in Iraq, and, and, the, and they're upset over something, and the government wouldn't do anything about it. So the corporations put together a mercenary force, start shooting at our veterans. How would you feel? Because that's what happened. That's a pretty serious thing. Shays Rebellion. We got a problem. We got a problem. Our central government's too weak to handle something like that. But we don't want to be too strong because it'll be tyrannical. What do we do? Well, we're going to have to fix this Articles of Federation. They knew there was no fixing. They were going to have to rip it up and start a whole new constitution. But they needed to create something. Well, let me back up now. Here's the term I usually use. What we needed was a lion, but the problem with lions is lions eat eat you. You want something strong enough to handle Shays Rebellion, to handle national defense, to handle trade with other nations, to handle securing the border. 
You need something strong enough to do those things, but you don't want it so strong that it turns on the people. You need a lion. The problem is lions eat people. What do you do? You create that lion and then you put it in a cage. You put shackles on its ankles. You secure it. Well, I was waiting for you to go back to the Navy, but you know, when, you know, I do aerospace stuff, you know, and you know, you, the aerospace pieces have to fit together. So you have various assembly techniques, mm -hmm. you know, and when it, your rights are attached to you, as you were talking about right. your hip. So the government's job is to secure those rights, to make sure they're in the right place, which right. is you, right. and nobody is taking them from you, then you have what you need to, uh, environmentally to be able to you know pursue if, if it's not just your life right and you know what happens when you say secure the hatches i mean why are you doing that you want to protect what's in those hatches you keep, keep everything in place that's right so that's yeah that's why they use the word secure it drives me nuts people say well go, go, governments are protecting guarantee our rights really they're there to guarantee your rights and, and let's use what well, i was going to do this earlier but let's use Healthcare. They said, well, we're here to guarantee your health care because it's a right. So we're going to create Obamacare to guarantee your health care because everybody should have health care. And if you can't afford health care, we're going to pay for it. We're going to make sure you get it no matter what, because it's a right. OK, well, the Second Amendment says that you're right to keep a bear. I have a right to keep and bear arms. So if that definition applies, how come the government's not making sure and subsidizing if I can't afford a gun to make sure I have my government issue gun? Well, obviously, then that's not the right definition of a right. right. We know that keeping bare arms is a right. So obviously, it's not their job to guarantee it, to make sure of it and subsidize it if we don't have it, because that's a ridiculous thing when it comes to your gun. Your rights are your responsibility. So if I want to, the right to keep and bare arms, it's my responsibility to go buy one, to clean it, to keep it in good condition, to get the ammo for it. That's my responsibility. Their responsibility is not to get in the way for, of me doing that. Well, your Obamacare deal, the reason that they have the money to pay for the guys who don't have the money is they're taking the money from other people. Well, that's a redistribution of wealth. Well, but see, that's the same thing with the Second Amendment. They ought to go to the guy who's got 20 guns and take four or five of his <laughs> and then give it to the people who don't have it because it's the same thing they're doing with the money. Yeah. You know, Samuel Adams was full aware of what redistribution of wealth was. The founding, yeah, I keep hearing people all the time, well, yeah, Doug, I know, but the founding fathers, they didn't know that Obama was going to happen and what the Democrats did. They had no idea. Bullpucky. They knew exactly what they were guarding against. That's why they wrote this the way they did. Samuel Adams called the redistribution of wealth the schemes of leveling. That was his term for it. And he said that the schemes of le leveling are both, um, oh, man, now, now, now I just forgot the exact quote. Uh, unconstitutional, and uh, there's another term you could use for it. Off the top of my head, I can't remember it now. But uh, they knew of this stuff. Communism, socialism. Well, Karl Marx wasn't born yet, Doug. So they called it utopianism. Same stuff. They tried it at Jamestown and and at Plymouth Rock. You know what happened? Yeah. People starved to death. So they said, okay, whoa, whoa, okay, right. this equal communion, well, they ain't working. 40 acres, is that what it was? So here's your land. You take care of it. You keep what you grow. If you have anything in excess, bring it to the free market and you can sell it or trade it. That worked wonderfully. People quit starving. When a communal system of collectivism like socialism is put in place, people starve and people die. Don't believe me? Look at Venezuela. You don't believe me? Look at Detroit. And in a theater coming to you real soon, California. Yeah, it's here. It's here. Yeah. For those of you who are not in California, be happy. Uh, California. Yeah, the point where it's, it's almost getting to the point where the taxes and everything's so high and the values of the houses are getting ready to drop that we're not going to be able to afford to leave if we wanted to. And then they'll tax you with an exit tax if you try to, to make sure you stay. I'll give them any ideas. No, they've already tried it before. This is the second time they they tried exit taxes twice, but they didn't pass. Isn't, isn't, um, isn't Chicago have? Any New York? Thing? Does New York do something like that? Yeah. No, because that's what uh, um, Rush Limbaugh. He's like, don't give them ideas. Yeah. I think Chicago's doing it too. Chicago? Yeah. They're doing it. 
Oh, yeah, 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 but that's called a death tax. That's a little different. I'm waiting for him to do the uh, justice of somebody's pension who lives in San Diego, retires, and then moves to Arizona. And if the cost of living is two thirds cheaper, to say, well, hey, then we're going to only give you two thirds of the pension. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get this right. Magna Carta. What was the Magna Carta? What, what year was that? You remember? 1215. What happened there? But after John, you know how John got away, right? For a little while before he got caught, dressed as a woman to escape. Is that the first? Is that the first time that transgenderism has shown up in history? Or? Yeah. Uh, Magna Carta was very influential. A lot of the language in that is the same, and it, and it and it was written by who? Well, the barons. It says we they began. Uh, we the barons essentially then went to all the free men, yeah. which is where we the people came from, by the way. But m most of not all the barons, but majority of them, they were illiterate. So who actually did the pinning of the Magna Carta? The priests. The priests. The religious class. The religious class has always been politically involved, all the way back to the Magna Carta, or you could talk about the Black Robe Regiment during, uh, during the American Revolution. They were the ones preaching revolution, and they were the ones that were attacked by, and, and, and seized upon by the British first because the British believed that they could break the back of our faith system. They would stop the cry for independence. So what, they, yeah, so what is the left doing today? They're trying to go after the church because they know the church is their obstacle. It's the reason why Karl Marx says, you know, he called, called religion the opiate of the masses. Why? Well, because if you believe that the Lord can handle it, you wouldn't want to, uh, their change. So it's the opiate of the masses in his opinion. This God thing has to be killed from their point of view. How dare we believe in something higher than the government? Government's supposed to be God, right? Yeah, he makes his did, did you read, maybe you had, but today there was an article in uh, Drudge about the guy in China, Xi, or however you say his last name, and that they're cracking down severely now. On yeah, choose, 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 choose your religion or the party. And they're taking yeah. down the pictures of the cross, and they're putting up a picture of him. Right. And that he wants the loyalty of the people to be to the government, which is really to him, and that he, yeah, 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 he, he needs the strongest leader since Mao. And, uh, right. China's starting to regret the uh, injection of capitalism and allowance of some religion, religious practices, because now it's starting to bite them. Because once the people enjoy these things, they want more of it. Yeah, so they're, they're cracking down. Yeah, uh, I, I, I see revolution in China in, in, in the coming years. I really do. It's going to get interesting. Tiananmen Square is nothing compared to what's on, on the way. All right. Uh, the Annapolis Convention, Shades of Rain, American Revolution, Glorious Revolution, 1688. There's something about England in, in the 88s. You know, the yeah. Spanish Amara was 88. I like that. Thank you. Interesting. Glorious Revolution, 1688, is the only revolution ever to be fought without a single fight. It was Whigs and the Tories. The, yeah, the, the Whigs and the Tories, and there was no shots fired. Uh, the uh, monarchy was acting in a way that was outside the Saxon system, and the threats and the and the, and the protests were so severe that it actually actually corrected themselves out of fear of a violent revolution. The Glorious Revolution was a nonviolent revolution. Nonviolent revolutions can turn a country around. Today we call them Tea Party groups and things like that, right? The following year, 1689, the English Bill of Rights, the English Declaration of Rights, of which our Bill of Rights uh, models itself after. So it's like when it came down to the uh, Constitution, George Mason said, I'm not signing that Constitution unless there's a Bill of Rights. How do you know there should be a Bill of Rights? Because there was an English Bill of Rights. He wanted something similar because he realized in his, for, in his now James Madison disagreed with him. We'll get into that more uh, deeply when we go over the preamble uh, uh, I mean, the Bill of Rights when we get to there. Um, 
George Mason, though, basically said, I'm not signing anything unless there's a Bill of Rights. All this does is tell the government, okay, if it's authorized, you can do it. If it's not, you can't. But it doesn't tell them to keep their claws off of our rights. So if you read the preamble to the Bill of Rights, it explains that the Bill of Rights was written specifically to protect us against the abuses of this new federal government because they saw it coming. They figured if they told them, by the way, shall not be infringed, Congress shall make no law, no soldier shall, shall not be violated, that government would listen to that at least. We have to. Mayflower, fundamental orders. Um, Slovenians, real quick. Very few people know about the Slovenians. Slovenia uh, historically is in this little pocket surrounded by mountains. There's one way in, one way out. And they always had these great republics, or they were under the control of some empire. Now, where did you put Slovenia over there? Slovenia is under the people. Okay. Slovenians had a great republic when they could have it, but when they were attacked, taken over, then they did. But then they went back to the same republic over and over because it was it worked when they weren't under the iron thumb of somebody. Thomas Jefferson studied the Slovenians. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, Montesquieu. Montesquieu wrote about the separation of powers. Polybius actually did that too, but Montesquieu went in a little deeper into it, that the different parts of government should not be able to interfere with each other's power. Legislative does only legislative. Executive only executes the law. Judicial only judiciates. Those other two should not be legislating. What do we have a big problem today of? We, ha we had a president number 44 who was legislating through his executive orders we have a court system that legislates from the bench both are unconstitutional violate separation of powers montesquieu was a french writer the french hated his writing because remember they're under that old roman authoritarian system colonists loved him he liked the saxon system he wrote what he wrote based on what he knew of the saxon system um and uh, that's pretty much everything we have on here, except for the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. I didn't really go over that much, but uh, Fundamental Orders of Connecticut and Mayflower Compact are very similar in, the, in this sense. Like the Declaration, it's very God-heavy. And when I say very God-heavy, let's wrap it up with this. Go to the very last page of the Declaration of Independence. You will find that on page 39 of your pocket constitution. We're going to wrap it up with this. I didn't get to charters either. Real quick, while you're turning your pages, the uh, Spanish Empire created their empire through conquest. Conquered empires get expensive to maintain, especially when all you're getting out of it is stealing gold and silver. So the Eng English decided we're going to do this in an entrepreneurial style. We're going to offer charters an opportunity. If someone purchases the charter, first of all, the, the monarchy made money off that charter. Then if the, if the, co the colony makes it, they pay taxes and that's good for the Monarch, if they fail, it didn't cost the monarch any money because they're not the ones that put the money out. It was an entrepreneur. It was a brilliant way of going out about it, but it also began with a free market kind of idea going into it. Uh, anyway, all right, so here's how we end the Declaration of Independence, and we end tonight. Final sentence. Think of these words very carefully. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, let me repeat that. Firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. What is divine providence? That is the care that God gives to his creatures. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. They put a lot on the line, but they knew that it was worth it because they had a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. In 2016, a woman saw my Trump sticker on my back window, and she says to me, gosh, you're brave. I said, why do you say that, ma'am? She says, well, if I had it on my car, my car would probably be keyed. Has your car been keyed yet? And I said, think about what you just said, ma'am. Founding fathers put on the line their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor, and you're worried about a paint job. Puts it in perspective, don't it? This is only ink and paper if we don't defend it. If we don't do what it takes, this is only ink and paper. If we're not willing to sacrifice our paint job or our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, this is only ink and paper.
All right, see you guys next week. We'll go deeper into the preamble, and we'll get into the legislative branch. Thank you for being here. And yes, sir. And uh, Jefferson, wasn't he hanging out with the Jacobian? Yes, yeah, so, no, but the, the Jacobins, he saw the Jacobins as very um, dangerous. He did not like Jacobins really followed Jean Jacques Rousseau's teachings. Uh, Jefferson, while he knew the Jacobins, he had been around them, he did not uh, agree with what they believed. Um, the Jacobins' uh, philosophies were put more towards the French Revolution and Jean Jacques Rousseau, uh, which is something actually that Thomas Paine wound up also becoming later to believe. And then Thomas Paine like went off the deep end, man. I mean, he was like this great revolutionary and a godly man. And then suddenly he like suddenly was a fan of the French Revolution, got involved with that, and then he wrote a book that uh, was basically against God. And, uh, Thomas Paine's a fascinating. He went like from great revolutionary to kind of knucklehead. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah. But but Jefferson was uh, familiar with Jacobins. He he did spend time with them, but not because he believed in what they believed. Uh, you got to know your enemy. You got to know what else is out there. Now, Alexander Hamilton did buy into John, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, belief system in the Jacobins. And uh, that's the reason why Hamilton was really, in my opinion, the first progressive. In fact, during the convention, at one point, he uh, called out that the president should be a king. He was what was called a monarchist. And he believed that the Constitution was fine, except for it didn't go far enough. It should have been a bigger, stronger government. Yeah, he was the one who started the first national bank, and, and the second one was based on his ideas, and he used the idea of implied powers and implied law in order to push that and convince everybody it was okay, because he, he argued that in the Constitution, there are not only express powers listed, enumerated powers given to the government as authorities, but that there's also implied ones. In other words, it implies this because... Uh huh. The invisible part. Yeah, the invisible part. You know, and, and while well, something's implied, well, if you're if you're a skilled enough orator, why well, you could get this to mean anything, right. and and you can convince anybody that it means anything. Alexander Hamilton, matter of fact, my one of my favorite books, other than the ones I've written, I've written six by the way, is Hamilton's Curse by a guy named Thomas J. Del Lorenzo. If you have not read it, read it. And we are living under Hamilton's curse. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, that video that you, the Mexican comedian you have on Pistachio, how did I hook into that? I want to send it to some other people. Um, on the video, uh, we're at the bottom where it says YouTube. If you click that, the YouTube page will come up. And on there, you, you'll get an embed or you get a link, anything that you want, number one. Number two, I've actually uh, emailed uh, Brian Day to be on my radio program, ask him to be on. Uh, what Don's asking about is uh, this, this Latino comedian out of Los Angeles named Brian Day, D-E-Y, B-R-Y-A-N-D-E-Y. And he's questioned by this other Hispanic and uh, about immigration, man. And, and Brian Day just knocks it out of the park. And the way he does it, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, well, don't you know? Don't, don't think it's so wrong if they you know, call us, you know, criminals and rapists, and you know, it was a question, you know, and, and drug dealers. And he says, well, first of all, if you don't, if you don't know that most of the drugs that come to the United States is, you know, you know, uh, not if you think that they're not coming from Mexico, you, you, you're either a fool or you're lying to yourself or something like that along the lines. Yeah, he says fifty-two percent. Fifty-two percent of crimes are committed by by Hispanic Americans. And then he's talking about the rapist party. He says, well, you know, dirty little secrets. Nobody knows this, but the uh, the age of consent in Mexico is 12. Wow. So they come here with that mentality. What and do you think is going to happen? In some states, it's puberty. And some some of the Mexican states, it's puberty. Yeah, so he, he really lays it out nicely. So you can look him up at briandey.com, B-R-Y-A-N-D-E-Y.com. It's his website. Yeah, but uh, the video is on political pistachio also, if you look for it. But, but yeah, it, it's just... I, well, I saw that and I was like, yeah. holy cow, man, yeah. this, this guy needs, yeah. and he is, he's a, he's a Latino comedian, but he's a conservative comedian. Wow. And the guy interviewing him seemed like a liberal. Yeah, he was, I think he was a liberal too, and I bet you by the end of the interview, he's probably going, huh, well, I, I, had fun said, a lot of this stuff, you know? He said that the liberals come after me with the racist stuff, and he just bounces off of them. <laughs> I know, yeah, uh, but anyway, all right, uh, politicalpistachio.com, douglasbgibbs.com, by the way. All right. Thanks. See you guys next week. All right.